प्रेजेंटेड बाय ईबिक्स कैश हर खुशी के लिए काफी है हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द बिजनेस टुडे शो आई एम योर होस्ट टू दयान मुखर्जी इंडिया हैज अ पावर प्रॉब्लम and not of the kind that you've been hearing about in the news over the last few days of the power problems in delhi the problem is much bigger it is that much of india's power is actually dirty 60% plus of our power comes from fossil fuels which is coal lignite diesel all the things which are terribly polluting and only about a quarter comes from renewable sources like wind like solar like hydro which is the kind of power we want but now all of india's big industrial groups are getting behind this problem from the ambanis to the adanis to the tatas they are all getting into this renewable game but what made news a few weeks back was that india's first renewable energy company got listed on the nasdaq and it was from a relatively younger company called renew power and my guest on the show today is actually a kind of a poster boy of renewable energy from india suman sena is the founder and chairman and ceo of renew power which got listed on the nasdaq so much is very good to have you on the show hello how are you i am good odian thank you so much for having me on your program you know in the sena family which you come from power means something else I mean, you know your father is yashwan sena the former finance minister your brother jayan sena is a prominent member of the current government but you eschewed that kind of power to get into renewable power tell us why you know i think the best kind of power there is is the renewable kind um it you know there's there's so much that you can do uh but let me take a step back you know uh, the the question really is uh, why renewable energy and why am i getting into it i think the reasons basically are the following that uh, you know renewable energy is the need of the hour uh you know you talked about the fact that india's uh, energy consumption uh, is very heavily skewed towards fossil fuels which it is uh, we all know that uh, and that's really dangerous in today's day and age in terms of uh, climate change and pollution and therefore uh, there is a very significant need for us to change the energy paradigm in india certainly and in, elsewhere in the world as well and we are therefore in the midst of this massive energy transition where we are moving from fossil fuel based um, energy systems to clean energy based energy systems and uh, not a moment to soon actually because uh, of the issues of climate change and so on and this is a very exciting uh, change that is happening it's a once in a lifetime kind of change uh, that is upon us at this point and because i was in the sector and i could see it happening uh, it seemed to me to make eminent sense to uh, to um, you know to devote my career to this sector and really to doing good in a different way uh, doing good in a way of creating jobs to clean up the environment uh, you know to, to to provide energy for a growing country like india i think that are, you know that's really the path that i embarked on and uh, as you know there there are many ways of doing good and certainly the way that i have chosen uh, to me seems like a very sensible way of of getting to that same end out well it's it's a commendable path but your i mean investors in india might hold a grouse against you you know there is very few renewable energy assets to invest in india but you chose to go all the way to the nasdaq to list uh, i i can understand there were good reasons for it but why not consider an ipo in india and give indian investors the chance of investing in your company yeah look odin that's a great question of course and we considered listing in india very seriously as well uh, and keep in mind that our decision was being made somewhere towards the end of last year almost a year ago uh, at which time the environment in india was quite different um and uh, so that is one thing i think the second thing of course is that esg investing globally has really really picked up and um, global investors are looking uh, very seriously at uh, good investment opportunities and for us uh, you know to take uh, the uh, the indian opportunity to global investors uh, and to tell them about how rapidly the indian market was growing uh, what the opportunities were what the government's program was to convert the energy system here towards renewable energy um and and to give them the chance of investing in india uh, and to invest in a reasonable size company like ours it seemed to make a lot of sense and from our standpoint what we get is access to a deep liquid pool of investors which hopefully can 
uh, help us in the future as well to raise capital, um, which is not to say that we might not have had the same opportunity in India, but it is just that to us, uh, global investors seemed uh, more aware of the changing dynamic in the, in the energy industry. And also with the focus, as I said earlier, on ESG investing, uh, seem to provide a better hmm. uh, receptivity to, uh, to a story like ours which is why we decided to list uh, outside of India. Very quickly, I want to touch upon the route that you took because it was like a merger with a, what we'd like to call a blank check company in RMG and you got listed through that route. Do you think a lot of Indian unicorns today of, from various sectors, now having seen what you've done, might actually explore that route to get listing overseas? Yeah, they could, Ode, Ode, and there's no reason for them not to. Uh, having said that, you know, markets are volatile and uh, at a certain point in time uh, in the US market, SPACs were a very attractive way to get to the market. And a number of companies, as you know, took that path, including ours, uh, to become public. Uh, I think today the attractiveness of SPACs uh, has come down and uh, SPACs have, SPAC investors have become a lot more selective. And so therefore they will look carefully at any new investment opportunity. And so therefore I think whichever Indian company wants to go down that path should obviously examine the market carefully. Now let's get back to the problem that we started with, which is India's uh, fossil fuel power problem. Now, renewable energy is what, about a quarter of the overall market size now. How soon do you see this transition happening? I mean, how soon can that 60% of dirty power come down to say 30, 40% and renewable energy get up to 50% plus? How many years will this take, you think? Yeah, you know, first of all, I would hesitate to call it dirty power or there. Uh, simply because uh, it's coal-based power, of course, it, it emits carbon, so to that extent, it's not the cleanest source of energy, but it is the source that has stood India in good stead so far. Um, and India, as you said, still relies on, on that for 60-65% of our total power generation, and that will continue to be the case for some time. Uh, now, today, renewable energy, uh, only wind and solar, accounts for about 10% of India's total power generation. If I add hydro, then that of course increases to the number that you mentioned, hmm. which is about 25%. But the government has set a fairly ambitious target by 2030 uh, to get the existing installed wind and solar capacity of 100 gigawatts up to about a 450 gigawatts by 2030, which would essentially mean that the 10% of today would become about 30 to 35% by 2030. Now, if I add hydro to the mix at that point, that number will probably go to closer to 50%. But the balance 50% will still continue to come from coal. Um, and and you know the, the, the reason for that is that India's power demand is going to grow very significantly over the next several years. So even though we're adding tremendous amounts of new capacity on renewables, it you know power demand is also growing. And therefore, the two will in some ways balance each other out. And uh, and so coal will therefore still be there by till about 2030. Now the question is what happens post 2030? After that, I think that renewables will become so much cheaper. Uh, the intermittency issue of renewables will start getting addressed through much cheaper storage, battery solutions and so on. And post 2030, I would imagine that we'll start looking at replacing legacy coal assets, which by that time, a lot of them would be nearing the end of their uh, normal life cycle in any case. And so from 2030 to 2040, I would see that that 50% number, including hydro, would probably grow to, grow to 70, 80%, uh, if not more. Let me ask you, I mean, where will Renew Power fit in? And let's assume that you're right. And by 2030, 50% of India's power comes from solar, from wind, and from hydro, the three put together. Of that 50%, how much do you think Renew Power will be? What would be your market you know, share? Yeah, so let's let's leave out the hydro part because that is already those capacities have already been put up, right? And a lot of those are owned by various public sector companies. Of course, there's some in the private sector as well. But I don't see a lot of new hydro getting built out because hydro A is expensive for new capacities. It takes time to build out, and there are there are various construction issues. So I doubt you'll have a lot more new hydrogen hydro capacity getting built out. Now, as far as wind and solar is concerned, we have so far been uh, having about a 10% market share of the total capacity. So of the 100 gigawatts, we have approximately an 8-9 gigawatt uh, capacity, and we've been winning market share at about 10% for the last several years. So I would say that if I, if I just sort of fast forward that number, it is quite conceivable for us to have that same percentage uh, by the time we get to 2030. 
right? Or it could be a little bit more depending on how well we're able to implement, how the market shapes up and so on. So I would say that's really where we would like to be. And given the large size of the market, you know, this uh, additional 350 gigawatts that we have to set up of wind and solar capacity will require almost $300 billion of total investment. That's a big number. And uh, I think it's going to be beyond the ability of any one company to be setting up large parts of that. And so therefore, I think, you know, having a reasonably good market share of that, that, you know, that we have right now would probably be something that would make a lot of sense even by 2030. I also see that, you know, the big guns are getting into this business in a big way. I mean, Reliance bought REC Solar for $771 million just the other day. Uh, the Adanis are interested, Tata's are getting in in a big way. But as you say, the market is very large. But do you think you would have access to capital to stand toe to toe with these people who have far greater access to capital because of the industrial groups that they represent? Do you think Renew will become remain a significant player in the solar business or in the wind business in the next decade or so? So then that's obviously the, the big uh, million dollar question from our standpoint. And of course, from our standpoint, we intend to be one of the big players in the industry even going forward. And the reason for that, reasons for that are, are multiple. I think the first is that, you know, it's not just about capital. It's also about expertise. It's also about capability. And I think, you know, we've been operating in the sector now for the last 10 years. Uh, that gives us a tremendous amount of knowledge about the industry. It gives us a tremendous knowledge about how uh, wind capacities work, how solar works, uh, how they both interface with each other, how to come up with solutions that combine different sources of, uh, of energy, renewable energy together, along with storage. Uh, you know, so we've built a number of capabilities in those areas that I think will stand us in good stead in the future. Uh, the second thing is, you know, as a company, we've raised almost $8 billion of capital in the last 10 years, right? From a startup situation. Now we're a reasonably well-established company. So there's no reason that we can't raise, you know, multiple times of that over the next 10 years. And so therefore, if you look at the plans that some of our, uh, you know, our big competitors have laid out, we are not going to be that far away from them just in terms of total uh, capital that we are likely to be able to invest over this time period. At this point, the ability of thinking a little bit innovatively, thinking differently uh, because of our understanding of the power markets uh, in the country uh, and so on. And you know, this is the only business that we have. And so therefore, we're going to make sure that 100% of our time is devoted to this business, whereas all the other guys have multiple other businesses to do that as well. Will you be focused mostly on India, Sumanth, or would you, do you have international aspirations? Because, you know, in 2008, you were the chief operating officer of Suzlon and you know, they did, they bought Ari Power, they bought Hansen. It did not work out for Suzlon uh, quite as well as they might have thought it would. But would you want to go down that path, pick up international assets as well in wind and solar? Yeah, so then let me answer that question a little bit more uh, broadly and say that there are a number of new areas that are opening up in our sector. Uh, green hydrogen is the most obvious one. Uh, storage is another one. Uh, there is the whole area of mobility. Uh, at some point, the power market in India will get opened up on the distribution side. So that's something that we, will, we could be looking at. Uh, on the transmission side, you know, now or more or less all the transmission that is going to be built in India is going to be to service renewable energy assets. Uh, that's a market that we've now bought into. We won our first bid on the transmission side recently. Uh, and, and, and so there are many different kinds of opportunities that, that we have at this point in time that we are ex in fact examining very seriously. International is one of those kinds of opportunities. And we'll obviously look at the international markets very seriously, in fact, we are. And, um, and I think we'll take decisions as we go forward. Uh, but the point to make really is that this sector is not just about setting up wind and solar assets. It's really broadening out a lot more. Uh, the energy markets are opening up. They are gonna be the next big growth opportunity in India. And I think we as a company now being one of the biggest power sector companies in India, uh, you know, across both conventional and renewable, uh, puts us in terrific position to take advantage of some of these opportunities, uh, both in India as well as outside. So to answer your question, yes, I think we would be looking at markets outside India as well. You touched upon a very important point, Suman, and I was going to come to it. I mean, this Electricity Amendment Bill of 2021, it has some really radical kind of proposals that, you know, uh, new private companies can actually compete with 
legacy discoms that consumers can actually choose their distributor do you see opportunity as a company at renew power with these i mean are you going to uh, actually participate in these things if they were to come about as proposed the proposals that have been made in the electricity act are actually phenomenal and it is very critical and very urgent for the government to actually pass the electricity act uh, because that actually puts choice in the hands of consumers and of course states will not be happy with that because it will it will mean that they lose control uh, but i think in the interest of developing the indian economy further and in the interest of uh, the consumer i think that is something that we must do now in addition to that the electricity act also has a number of other very positive features so all in all i would say the electricity act amendment does need to be passed very quickly uh, by the government uh, it's going to be very positive for the sector as a whole and i think will be you know will actually almost take the entire indian economy onto a different trajectory now would we as a company participate in the in the distribution sector we definitely would consider it very seriously in fact there were a couple of privatizations that happened of some union territories and we did try to participate in those unfortunately we didn't win but it's it's a, it's a, it's a part of the uh, power sector that we definitely want to look at very seriously speaking of which i mean how much of your aspirations will be captured by in the inorganic space i mean you have picked up some assets in uttarakhand in telangana at renew power i mean do you see yeah. the inorganic possibility as a big one for your company uh, uh, because uh, you could potentially go about uh, buying assets uh, internationally and in and in india uh, would you consider that no you are absolutely right odhan and we absolutely would consider uh, doing uh, uh, uh mna to grow inorganically as well you know ultimately our our desire is to uh, is to uh add more assets to our portfolio and um, you know we can do that organically but we can equally do that inorganically and you know the interesting thing is if you look at the renewable energy sector right now you know we are the largest company in the space but our market share is only about 8% and that tells you that it's a very fragmented market there are many many players uh, a lot of companies trying to come in and and create a business in this area and a lot of companies have a model of just building and then selling assets uh and some of them will do it voluntarily some of them will do it involuntarily because they just won't able to execute well and so therefore there is going to be a fair bit of churn in our sector and that churn is going to give us opportunity to acquire assets and and grow in organically as well a larger part of your career was the aditya birla group i mean you were the cfo for a long time you handled the set up their retail business and it struck me the other day when i mean the possibility of speaking to you that i should also ask you i mean you would have been in the hot seat at aditya birla group today if kumar mangalam birla were to ask someone what to do with vodafone idea you were the go to man then what would you have told him because he's walking away it seems from vodafone idea uh, he doesn't want to put in any more capital what would your advice to him at this juncture would uh, have been you know then i wish i could have give, given him some advice but again the reality is that i have not been in the telecom sector for many many years i last worked in the aditya birla group almost uh, uh 13 years ago uh and of course at that time the telecom sector was taking off and and i was a big votary when i was in the group that the group should stay in telecom uh but of course everything the whole landscape the whole environment has changed over the last so many years so so i i don't know i i would not have been able to give him uh, advice without having been um, you know actually in the telecom sector working with him for some time because it's not just a question of what's happening in the sector it's also a question of what's happening in the rest of the group and you know how is the group positioned and what the thinking is about growth areas and so on so you can't just you know give that advice in isolation so i would hesitate to to be able to give you any answer on that okay let me go back to the my first question to you then i mean how is it in the family for you guys you know you know your father is now with the trinamool congress he was a prominent uh, political leader your brother had 12 years in mckinsey before he chose to get back into the political path i mean it it's fascinating for us on the outside to think of what dinner table conversations would be like between the two sons and the father what is it like well you know odhan the good thing is we seldom have dinners together uh, and so therefore we very you know rarely get together to have any kind of conversations and i think it's just as well because all of us have such differing views on so many issues that it would not lead to a very constructive conversation so i think uh, look we are all we are all professionals we are all you know doing our own thing in our own different ways and um, and we keep our 
uh, our professional side very separate from the personal side. It may be hard to to uh, believe for a lot of people who uh, are looking at it from the outside, but you know, frankly speaking, um, you know, between my father and myself, we, uh, you know, he's he's run his professional career totally separately from from me. I have not had any uh, visibility into what he's been up to or what he's thinking of or what he's doing, and uh, and, and obviously uh, no ability to influence. And the same thing with my brother. I think he does whatever he thinks is appropriate from his standpoint. So I think from that standpoint, we are all very, very separate individuals. So finally, if I were to ask you, Suman, I mean, since this is your big game in life, I mean, you've had a corporate corporate career, but this is your baby. I mean, this is entrepreneurship. Where do you see yourself in in ten years' time? And if I had to ask you for a very brief mission statement or vision statement. What are you trying to create with Renew Power? What is the scale of your ambition? Oh, then that's uh, that's really really a terrific question, and um, that's something obviously that I've thought about many many times. Um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, Renew is my baby. Uh, it it's grown much faster and much more than I had ever thought when I started the company. Um, my aspirations have obviously grown over time uh, with what we have been able to achieve at Renew. Uh, new horizons have always continued to open up as our sector has grown and as our company has grown, and I'm sure that will continue to happen in the future as well. But since you've asked me the question right now, let me try to respond about you know uh, where I where I am right now. So look, we are at this point close to a five billion dollar market cap company, about nine billion dollars enterprise value. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, up close to a ten percent market share of the Indian renewables market. Which itself is growing rapidly. Uh, what I'd like to do essentially is to help India in this energy transition. I think that's a, it's a, it's going to be a mammoth task. And as I said earlier, it's a once in a lifetime task. But I think it's a very, very critical thing for us to do because the choices that India makes uh, on our energy systems are going to be very fundamental in the world's battle against climate change. Because India is already eight percent of carbon emissions globally. and because we are growing so rapidly given our pace of development that percentage is going to keep going up and we can't let that happen and at the same time we can't also uh, prevent growth from happening we have to given the, the the standards of life and the economic per capita incomes and so on we have to make sure that indians have the unfettered right to grow and and therefore yeah. converting our carbon our, our, our energy systems from carbon based to clean based systems i think is is a very important aspect and i think if i can contribute to that in some measure uh, that would be a job well done i'm sure you'll go on to do that sumant uh, the journey has just begun and it's begun very well for you so i wish you all the best and may you go on to achieve all that you uh, have in mind uh, your vision and mission plan thank you very much for taking time out for us today thank you so much odian such a pleasure talking to you as always and it was great to be here thank you That was Suman Sinat. We shall return next week with another prominent personality from the world of business. Till then.